Within Previs in general, there is a um, essentially an escalation of the, the amount of visual detail that clients often ask for. Um, you know, more detail in the animation, more detail in how we model the assets, more detail in you know, how the environments are textured, more detail in kind of the look, the feel, the atmosphere. And frankly, those things don't come easily to Previs. You know, it, it's a little bit, at certain times, it becomes a little bit contradictory to what we're supposed to be doing, which is light, fast, iterative, kind of coming up with ideas, experimenting with new ideas. So, you know, the more you bog it down with, because detail equals kind of geometry, higher res textures, um, higher res models, those things don't, those things don't result in faster scenes, they bigger, bulkier, heavier scenes. So I think with, you know, from my point of view, at the onset of a project, a big part of it is sitting down with the client and really trying to understand what the goals are, creatively what the goals are, what is it that we're being asked to, um, what is it we're being asked to produce, but also really beginning to examine who the audience is. Who's going to be looking at this previs? and trying to understand kind of what their personalities are and what their appetites are. Because what I'm discovering is that there is no, there's no kind of one size fits all for Previs. Everyone has different expectations. Clients have different personalities. Productions have diff different personalities. Some productions are much more literal. They need to see every little detail, every bullet hit, every dust hit. Um, some productions, you know, can think more abstractly and are very comfortable with abstraction, kind of cleaner environments, lower res, less detail, a more muted color palette. So we're coming up with solutions and ways to kind of um, essentially present a menu to our clients and say, you know, which one are you responding to better? We can go either way, they each have their implications. If you go down the road of a more kind of simplified abstract look, you're not going to get a lot of visual detail, you're not going to be able to kind of resolve a lot of color choices, but you will be able to kind of break it down into its kind of component elements, movement, speed, pacing, shot selection. Um, so yeah, there's always a bit of an evaluation that happens at the beginning of every project and trying to deduce what the goals are, what the needs are, and what people's appetites are. Um, but I don't feel like the, that kind of escalation into detail is inevitable. I think it's a choice. And, and part of our job is to educate our clients that it is a choice. They can choose that direction, and that's completely fine. But we also like to inform them of other, you know, other styles, other ways they can go. All kind of, they all have the same amount of information. We're not talking about the, the value of the previs. We're simply talking about visual communication and how they're going to respond and who's going to respond kind of more favorably to one style versus another. Everyone recognizes at this point that you know, the benefits they get out of previs for kind of big visual effects, stunt-driven, complex filmmaking. Um, I don't think anyone questions that. And I think that anyone going into a film and they're faced with a, a shot, a sequence, or, you know, an entire third act that is going to be, you know, involve kind of intense visual effects, physical effects, even complex locations. We do a lot of work that isn't really even um, about visual effects, but more about kind of working within the constraints of a, of a tricky location. Um, how are we going to shoot in here? You know, what kind of equipment can we fit in here? I think everyone really has begun, you know, production studios have really realized and, and um, you know, grasped the benefits of Previs for all of that work. Um, you know, where, where it becomes a little bit trickier is once you move into kind of performance, dialogue, um, you know, the more kind of emotional content of a film. Uh, Previs still can't quite capture that in an effective way. And uh, I've certainly seen films that have tried to previs those moments that are really you know, more performance driven than action driven. And I think that's still an area where previs um, you know, isn't necessarily the right tool or maybe isn't the only tool, is not the, maybe not the best way to approach it. Um, you know, feathering together you know, some storyboard, maybe some voice recording, um, some things that really kind of can communicate the emotional content more effectively than our previs avatars and our models running around. You know, we've gotten really good at communicating kind of basic emotional states, you know, kind of anger, frustration, happiness. But once you get into more subtle performance, kind of nuanced performance, um, you know, that's where the previs kind of starts to lose its effectiveness. So the, the approach that I advocate, um, you know, with our clients is, you know, we'll kind of define those moments where the previs is really going to bring the greatest value. It's going to bring the greatest value when there's the greatest amount of action. Um, whether that action is visual effects action or just stunt action, 
um, or you know those those kind of tricky, complicated head scratching shots that no one's quite sure how they're going to achieve. Once we move into the dialogue scenes, once we move into kind of the emotional content of the film, we can block it out. But at that point, I don't advocate such a detailed previs. I don't think we should necessarily animate every action of the characters. We can maybe move towards kind of a more primitive animation, more kind of blocking animation, and then augment that with either subtitles or voice recordings that help kind of move the, the emotional component of the story along until you get to the next big action beat. So it's not as if there's kind of a monolithic, like we're gonna previs the entire film to the same level of, of, of detail to the same level of accuracy, I think you need to look at previs and kind of say, okay, we're going to apply it you know, at these specific moments because these are the trickiest bits. And in between, we can get by with kind of a, a less detailed approach, maybe a, a simpler blocking pass of the previs, or maybe we go, you know, we kind of step away from previs entirely and go into storyboards or animatics or, as I said, you know, simple voice recordings. And I think that productions are really beginning to understand that there is no kind of one way to approach these things. You have a lot of tools at your disposal. And even within previs, there are a lot of ways to use it. I mean, we can do simple blocking passes very quickly that really effectively communicate kind of the action and flow of a sequence without necessarily getting into the kind of detail of every specific shot and every lens and every camera angle. Because for those sequences, they might just show up on set and really kind of find it with their actors. We don't necessarily want to tie the director down to, you know, a specific kind of roadmap that he can't stray from or she can't stray from, but we want to give them kind of an understanding of what their limits are. You can move this way, you can move that way, you can be this far back, you know, the set works within these kind of constraints and with these extents, but within that you have kind of total freedom to play. So we're always looking to, to work with our, with our clients in a way that says, we'll get really specific when we need to be, when you need that level of detail and need that level of information, but we can also be a little bit more abstract and a little bit kind of more general. Um, in areas where you can simply go on set and find those moments yourself and kind of find that, you know, then let the intuition and the performance guide how you're going to shoot it. The creative decision making when on a film, and that's, that's really why I got involved with Previs to begin with and what really hooked me early on was this kind of the idea, the kind of dynamic around the creative decision making that happens. And, you know, we can call it politics because there's a certain amount of politics, but it's more personal politics than anything else. Kind of who's going to take the lead, who's going to put the ideas out there, um, you know, who's going to respond. Certain directors, you know, certain directors are the visionaries in the sense that they'll come in and they'll kind of describe the vision and really kind of paint a very clear picture. And, you know, our job as the previs artist is basically to manifest that, to kind of make that real so that the director can see it and evaluate it and decide whether or not that's really what they were thinking of, um, and more importantly, to then communicate that to everybody else, because oftentimes the director's vision, if it stays within their head, no one else gets to see it. <laughs> so, you know, in those instances, our job is really just to kind of be a medium through which we can manifest the director's vision. Um, you know, there are other moments where, you know, the director might come in and, you know, they're more of a, you know, they need to see it. You know, they, they have an intuitive sense of what they're looking for, but they can't necessarily explicitly describe it. Um, so you have to sit there and you kind of have to listen to the metaphors and, and the descriptions and kind of there's some colors that might come out and, you know, ambiguous words that don't necessarily mean anything specifically, but you have to kind of listen to the sum total of the words and all the gestures and the facial expressions and kind of go, okay, I get the vibe, I get the feeling of what we're going for. Um, you know, and those jobs are, you know, are equally exciting because then you're kind of left there to kind of figure out how to put all the pieces together. Ideally, we end up in a situation where, you know, the, between the director, the visual effects supervisor, the production designer, you know, everyone is kind of coming to the table and sharing their, their ideas of what this is supposed to look like. And the previs artist's job really is to kind of synthesize all that information. To understand who's, you know, you have to understand whose vision kind of carries more weight than someone else's because oftentimes the ideas might conflict with each other. But, you know, that for me is really the exciting part is when we as artists kind of get to take all this information in from all these different sources and begin to synthesize it into one kind of cohesive idea that works in time and space and start to lens it and put cameras on it and then reflect that back to the director, to the production designer, the visual effects supervisor, um, and get their feedback and kind of say, oh, that's not really what I was thinking. I was kind of going more this way, more that way. Or, and this is always kind of the, you know, for us the goal, is that we get to reflect back the, the vision of the filmmakers 
but then we add that little something extra. You know, we, we, we're the ones who live with it all day long. We're really kind of steeped in this, you know, 10 hours a day, five days a week. And every so often that little moment, I mean, hopefully more often than not, that moment of inspiration comes in and, um, you know, really just kind of sparks an idea that you can then show to the director and the director goes, ah, that's it. That's, you know, that's what we're looking for. That's that kind of little something extra. Um, on Captain America, um, the initial idea for the, the Quinjet Leap just had Captain America jumping up into the air and throwing his shield at the Quinjet and disabling it and the Quinjet comes crashing down and Captain America lands back on the ground and, and it, was, uh, it was Dan DeLue and Monty, I think, who came up with the idea that, you know, that Cap should actually kind of vault himself up onto the Quinjet and really kind of, rather than kind of be at a distance from it, and kind of you know take it down remotely that he should really kind of get up there and ride the dragon um, and uh, you know that was an idea that from kind of from the moment they came up with that little germ of an idea it just sparked a whole series of creative decisions about how the sequence was going to play out and turned it into this really I mean although it's a short bit of action it's a really dynamic and really exciting thing that you know frankly if you hadn't if you weren't seeing it kind of play out as animation, if you weren't seeing it kind of play out as a movie, you might never have arrived at that moment. But those are really, I mean, as, as previous artists, those are the moments that we're always most excited about. You know, show the filmmakers what they're asking for. Do your best to kind of manifest their vision, but then add that little extra layer, come up with that extra idea. And, you know, if it excites, if it ignites and turns into something, then we get to go to the films afterwards and kind of go, ah, you know, I remember where that idea came from. I was in the room. And that takes a very special kind of person to, um, you know, both come up with that level of inspiration and come up with that idea, but also to kind of, you know, be satisfied and be content with kind of being the behind the scenes person. Not necessarily the director, not necessarily getting the full credit, but being part of that creative team. And that for me is, is really kind of what defines a previs artist is that, you know, at root, you know, we are, you know, we're creative collaborators, we're creative problem solvers, um, and that we really relish being part of a team. And, you know, the, the goal for us and the goal for me always on any project is, you know, did my involvement make the whole thing better? You know, did, 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 did our involvement, you know, me personally, if I'm on a show or kind of our involvement, you know, if it's a proof project, our team, did we somehow make that a better movie, a more exciting, more enjoyable cinematic experience? And, you know, hopefully we do our jobs well and, and the outcome is, is better for it. FMX is the best. Um, I'm, I make a point of coming here every year. I believe this is my, I believe this is my fifth year at FMX. And, uh, you know, frankly, I look forward to it, um, you know, for months beforehand. I think it's a... Uh, it's a remarkable event. The, the quality of the individuals that they bring here, the quality of the presentations, and the, the magic of it for me has always been, and I don't quite know, you know how Thomas and Jean-Michel and the rest of the crew kind of create this environment, but it's, just a, it's such a collegial environment where people aren't necessarily um, you know, kind of showing off um, and kind of bragging about what they've done, but they really come here to share what they've accomplished over the past year, share the kind of advances that they've created, and, and you know, take pride in their work, which is a fantastic thing, um, you know, without being, you know, without that kind of, kind of competitive, um, you know, kind of adversarial feeling to it. It's, uh, it's a remarkable, you know, kind of intangible thing that happens here where, you know, you have a bunch of individuals who frankly, you know, oftentimes are, are competing against each other throughout the year and get to come, you know, come together and really kind of sit and talk to each other and share ideas and share experiences. And, and that makes it worth coming back every year.